and good to see you all. I know it's day two, but good to see everybody uh, in here right now, and I'll just go right up to it. I come from a uh, small African country, um, Uganda, and uh, we've got about 45 million uh, population that's mainly agro-based, agro but we're now on a digital journey. And I'll just tell you the story about our digital journey as we've made along building a digital government in Uganda. Well, that's our elderly president, of course, and the minister, and uh, uh, our CEO, as we were opening up and launching uh, our foundational fiber optic cable that's running around the country, more than 4,000 kilometers now of fiber. But just a little brief about the overview of NITA, uh, or National IT Authority. So the National IT Authority of Uganda is an autonomous body established in 2009 to coordinate, promote, and monitor IT developments in Uganda. So obviously Uganda is an African country in East Africa, just in case, you know. And then NITA is also under the general supervision of the Ministry of ICT, and our vision is to transform citizens' lives through e-services delivery. So keep that in mind. We're trying to transform citizens' lives or Ugandans' lives through service delivery electronic service delivery. So as director of e-government services, we set a path to lay a foundation for uh, service delivery about nine years ago. We had to set up some infrastructure, as I mentioned to you. We've now got a 4,300 kilometer backbone in the next two years. We hope to triple that. Uh, we have green transmission sites using solar. We've got public Wi-Fi now. We've got a government cloud uh, a sovereign cloud and disaster recovery center uh, running more than 300 government applications. We've also had to put up enabling uh, environment with cyber laws and most recently a number of laws, about nine laws. Most recently, we now have the privacy and data protection law. We also do cyber security for the country. We also do automation, uh, re-engineering of application, e-government application, shared services, uh, and web portals. So we, we're like the IT arm of the government, but we also regulate on the other hand. And then we have got capacity building, of course, that we do, advisory, and all that culminates into an e-government uh, ecosystem. But how do we, we wanted to improve the service delivery through automation. How do you reach a rural population, a country that has a heavy rural population, um, you know, with many that are still struggling with just getting connectivity, struggling with a, getting a smartphone device. And so we wanted to make sure that we automate as much as we can. Offering services requires many documents issued by many entities. It was one of our biggest problems that we found. We found that there was a lot of paper manual documentation going on in the country. And processing takes longer. There's a lack of real-time information sharing. So it was a country that was seated on isolated, siloed government systems. So the story is, is brief. Before using UG Hub, now UG Hub is the brand that we called it. It's basically a service bus, or an enterprise service bus, an integration layer that's built on WSO2 as part of the foundation to build digital transformation in Uganda. So whenever you hear UG Hub, UG Hub is really a WSO2 platform that's integrating and transforming the way we do business in Uganda. So when you see UG Hub, UG stands for Uganda Hub. So first of all, before we used WSO2, we were scanning physical documents. It was a very peppered uh, government. Lots of paper everywhere, lots of manual systems, lots of queues uh, in every government institution you went to. In fact, I think we had many governments in one government. You had to go to the tax authority, line up. You had to go to the investment authority, line up with more paperwork. You had to go to the business registration and line up with more paperwork. So lots of physical documentation. There was a lot of sharing of data, government data on movable drives because there was no integration. So you had to move flash disks around in government, in government uh, you know, institutions. And I'm not proud of that at all, but that was the situation. We were sharing data on, on channels like email and phones and, and SMS. There was direct ad hoc sharing without any form of governance. This is what it looked like way before 
um, is what it looked like way before uh, we set it up UG Hub or WSO2. You had a super Getty kind of setup. You had entities doing point-to-point -point, uh, integrations, uh, and then these represent different you know, URAs, Uganda Revenue Authority, the Social Security Fund, Identity Register, the Capital City Authority, the Judiciary, Agriculture. So ministries, local governments, departments were all siloed. They did not talk to each other, but then we began to build point to point, you know, way before that. And you can see the kind of look and feel that we had. Very tedious and costly, uh, the custom made connections that we had, upgrading each application was a nightmare because you also have to upgrade you know, the, 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 the APIs there. We had disorganized and poorly managed uh, services, prone to failure and stability, disparate systems that were siloed, protocols and standards were hardly there uh, with legacy systems. We had multiple security endpoints to worry about and of course an increased uh, complexity and therefore loss of agility and flexibility. This is what it looked like before we had a platform, an enterprise platform. So we began to introduce UG Hub, or the Uganda Hub, and our target was to make life easy for our citizens, so life made easy. And our idea was that we need to find a solution, a platform, a technology that will take us to where we need to go. After a tedious um, bidding process, we looked at multiple, multiple platforms, and we picked WSO2 as our vendor, or rather as our you know, uh, partner of choice. And therefore, this is rather a busy slide, but this tells a bit of a story in the few minutes that I have right now. It tells you um, a story about what we want to do. So for the first number of years, as you look at the bottom, we were building the foundation blocks for digital transformation. We went ahead to do storage and hosting of government systems sovereign in the country, so we have a government cloud now running. We have a national backbone running on fiber optic cable with more than 4,000 kilometers. We hope to make that 12,000 in the next three years. So we're building connectivity, because you don't want to, in how do you integrate systems with an unconnected country where citizens have no access? SMS and payment gateways, unified communications. We had emails, uh, government institutions running on Gmail and Yahoo and, and you know, all sorts of uh, public uh, so we had to do unified comms and of course building a PKI digital signatures that is running right now. And all of that was running off a telecom network connected to the banking, uh, banking network. So we now have government networks and private networks then now culminating into the second layer. We then built this layer that went live on WSO2 uh, about two years ago. So it's been running since uh, 2022. So it's been about uh, 2021 actually, two and a half years now. So we've got about two and a half years of running a national integration platform that I called UG Hub based on WSO2. And you can see that we had you know, the enterprise integrator, identity server that we're not using as much, a lot of the API manager, the catalog and the IoT servers all enabled. And basically what's happening right now is that for the first time as a country, we've got a multiple registers. This is the revenue authority, the judiciary and police, the national identity, the lands office, business register, and multiple MDAs. MDAs, MDAs are ministries, departments, agencies, all running and talking to the layer, the WSO2 layer. You also have energy, utilities, telecoms, banks now. Every commercial bank, and I don't say this very often, but every commercial bank is now running off this system for their KYC. And KYC is happening now because all these banks and this, that should have been probably at the top for easy understanding. The private sector talks to the system and then talks to the government public sector layer. The telecoms and banks, utilities all want to access these registers. And so the banks want to talk to the identity register, for instance, for KYC. KYC now happens in about three to five seconds. Three to five seconds. It, it took bank opening, account opening sometimes took four days before a bank could approve um, your approvals, purely because they had to understand who you truly are. And that took lawyers, middlemen, and different people, and different sums on the citizen. You now have a press of the button through the API, and the banks can now talk to the register. 
The idea is that now we have a one government approach for the first time. We always had multiple governments, so to speak, in one government. But now you have one government. Talk to the government platform with WSO2 and you have access to the government registers. So this, for me, I think, is a great start in two and a half years of a rollout. So what's our vision? We've now built this and we're now expanding. In the next one year and a half, we're going to be expanding this and rolling this out even further to more MDAs, local governments, ministries, you know, getting everybody on board on this layer. Right up there are e-services. When you now have all these registers here, out of this will come e-services. The e-services can you know, manifest as a government, a citizen's portal. So for the first time, we'll have citizens now with a super app, a government super app that has your driving permit applications. You have, you have all these things that you can do with your national ID, less queues, everything done in the convenience of your home and in your office. And we're now testing out some prototypes right now where you can do that. Basically, e-service is now running on a mobile portal or on a citizen's mobile app. All of this is possible because we now have integration, integration of that layer being done. It's a slow process, I must say. It's, it's a very delicate process. You're trying to get everybody's mind uh, you know, turned around in terms of this thinking. So the next idea is to also have, now that we have integration of platforms, we can have dashboards for the first time. We don't have government dashboards. I've told my, I've made a pledge, which is a tough pledge, and I, I've told my ministers and the cabinet that I will soon give you, you know, government information in one pen. I would love the president of Uganda to be on his tablet, on his way to the airport or way to another meeting, and in one pen, he can view statistics and the health of the government, financial information, registry information, lands information. We can actually mine a lot of information out of these databases now that are talking to each other and provide dashboards for the government. This would be a big move for decision-making, data-driven decision-making. We also want to do, of course, uh, predictive monitoring of our government systems, data mining, you know, the API marketplace, monetization. We want to do e-consent for the first time. We've now got a data privacy law, and we want that citizens are empowered to you know, opt in and opt out for their data, and whether they want to share that data. All that is only possible now because we have a layer, a WSO2 layer that sits right there. All right, then we've got Access channels. Imagine what you can do now with all of this, now that it's integrated. You've got a mobile citizen's portal that will be for the first time. We'll have that. And we really hope to launch this before the end of this year. It's a bit of a tight, tight rope. We have a citizen's portal. We want to do a developer portal. We want to invite developers now to participate in this e-government race and say, look, developers, you know, come and see what we need to do because we can't do all the e-services for our citizens. We don't even know what every citizen needs, but we're saying developers should come in. We want to invite the developer community to come in and then, you know, add to the body of knowledge uh, in our portal. Of course, USSD in Uganda, most of the phones are still feature phones. They're not smartphones like many other countries. We, we don't have the buying power to ensure citizens all have smartphones. So we must ensure that you've got USSD, you've got SMS for your OTP and one-time passwords and everything, all channels for accessing government services. So basically, you want to place as many channels in the hands of, of our citizens. And of course, up there, you have Citizens View, developer community, businesses like banks now are consuming, insurance organizations are now consuming uh, the services here. You've got citizens that will be excited to consume government services for the first time in one place, in one pen, in one app, now because of WSO2 platform. You have government ministries now, so you have a G2G uh, interaction that's happening. You have government agencies, local governments, all now being able to talk to each other, and all of this ecosystem and, and setup is now possible because of this bridge that's right at the center here. We hope that in the next few months, we shall also be turning on more facilities around our identity server, going towards a digital ID. It's something that I've been discussing throughout this conference with the, the people that matter to see how Uganda can actually work through an identity server approach for uh, better identification. Okay, so um, 
this is basically what happens. You have government institutions all around now talking to the WSO2 UG Hub platform and their requests. Some are one directional, some are two directional. You have entities that are exposing their APIs, others that are consuming, but many that are only consuming, which is also okay. The banks right now are just consuming uh, you know, APIs on, on EKYC, EKYB, you know, your business and the others. But you, know, you have an ecosystem now that's fully uh, integrated. This is a bit of um, you know, how the architecture looks like. You know, you've got your, your middleware at the center there, and you've got these different entities now talking, exposing, consuming uh, services. Some of the key products, for those who would like to know what we're using right now, of course, we're using the catalogs up there, the enterprise integrator, API manager, identity and access manager, yet to fully utilize that. But that's a good area for us to work harder on. Analytics and dashboards, another area we want to work on. Right now, the analytics and dashboards are purely um, to understand the number of calls and operational data that's going on. But we'd like to actually have a data lake. We'd like to have a, a data warehouse for the government that actually aggregates this data, and we can actually make, you know, have insights and predictive monitoring coming out of that. Then you have mobility module, and then the IoT module. And some of these modules are yet to be fully utilized. So in the next six months, we will be having a huge implementation that might go to about a year that tries to go deeply into some of the modules and components here to bring them alive to make our vision possible. So basically, this is what it looks like, and it's a technology stack all around ERPs, legacy systems. Most of our systems in Uganda are legacy systems. So it's one thing to try to integrate the government. You go out there to bring everybody together, but not, not everybody's been designed and built to share data. So many institutions require, you know, hand-holding, building of these legacy systems, building APIs. It's a delicate journey, and we're willing to take the time to do it right. It won't be a, a quick fix. As I begin to close, we began 2015, which is almost nine years ago. We had a feasibility study of all our integration databases, which is a good place to start for, for governments. We said, look, what, do we have any integration? What are the databases and registries in the whole country? What can you do with that? By 2019, we also passed the Data Protection and Privacy Act, a very critical step before you begin to integrate and have data exchange. 2022, we had a fully functional and piloted uh, UG Hub on WSO2. And this year, 24, we're going to be doing a major expansion, a major upgrade and expansion of this database, of this system, rather, to take us to the next level. Okay, and then maybe almost lastly, I would say we have more than 135 onboarded entities now in two and a half years. Half of those, about 62 of those, are public uh, registries, large database producers and data producers and uh, data, uh, you know, controllers. 73 of those are private institutions. We have fintechs now. We have banks. We have insurance organizations. We have all sorts of players now who want to consume what the public uh, institutions are providing. And so you have something like this. You can see the yellow chart here. Most of that is EKYC. That's NIRA. NIRA is the database. It's the National Identity Register. You'll find that for most governments, the identity register is probably the most consumed service. Everybody wants to do KYC. People are now building businesses just on accessing identity. Identity alone is, is, is now opening up new fintechs, new lines of business, revenues for people who would like to, to use that for account opening, you know, for, uh, you know, for money, uh, micro lending. Everybody wants to consume those services. In green here, you've got the tax. Everybody wants to file taxes. Everybody wants to get a PIN or a tax identification number. So you've got lots of, lots of that. So you've got more than 1.6 million transactions alone in February this year. Just, you know, back and forth transactions running off uh, this WSO2 platform. Maybe just a quick one is that we had some success stories, I must say. Improvement in service delivery is something that we are really, really proud of right now. Uh, there's a huge reduction in turnaround time in offering public services. As I mentioned to you now, eKYC or account opening using mobile devices in rural areas now just takes three to five seconds uh, for account opening. And that's happening through 
WSO2 uh, platform. You have now more revenue collection that's happening now through the different channels uh, because you've aggregated government services in one place and therefore people can, can pick e-services and make payments uh, online. So we have an e-payment gateway also. So you've got non-tax revenue now uh, as, a, as an increased possibility. We're now supporting private entities to improve service offerings. So the private sector, as you noticed, is almost more excited now than government institutions. They can see the value and they're logging on to, 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 to provide better services. And then you have new business service streams cropping up now in the private sector, simply because they have access for the first time to real-time government information. So now the private sector is thriving. You have small startups that are just building around this ecosystem. And I think that's, that's the direction we wanted to take. Some success factors, I must say. We had robust and secure WSO2 platform, which we must, we must say has been a really, really big deal. Um, we used a local uh, partner, a WSO2 partner called Sibyl Uganda Limited. They provided local support and skills transfer. I think it's important to always have a local partner that can work along with WSO2. And I think that's the ecosystem, you know. And then enabling regulatory framework that was important to build a framework way before you start to integrate uh, applications. And then interconnectivity and internet training and skills capacity built on WSO2 technology. In my team now, I've got a couple of young engineers now who are API manager trained. They are trained on the integrator platform, on the identity server, and, and you know, they are learning to, to learn and to pick up. So my team, working closely with Sibyl, a local partner, working closely with WSO2, has built you know, a great support system, which I think is a success a factor for this project. And as I close, basically the limitations and lessons learned, uh, I don't even want to go deeply into this, but you will find that many times there are just no APIs in government systems. So you'd love to integrate the whole of government, but there are no systems. Some government institutions, I would dare say this, still very comfortable using Excel sheets. All right, you still have Excel sheets in some government institutions, but you've got to integrate them. WSO2 can actually pick an Excel sheet and expose that you know, into a better format. So we're basically saying that this layer now can bring just about anything from an access database, Excel sheet, you know, REST format, whatever format it is, and then make sense out of those that want to uh, bring it in. So I won't go too deeply into some of the limitations here, but there are always ever-changing business requirements from our government customers. You know, they're just ever-changing. Something's changing. There's a need to freeze and sign off requirements but this is a topic I can get into with other government institutions that want to roll out. But there's just so much possibility when you start to roll out such a, a big project. So the next immediate steps is basically expansion of our platform. We're going to do that this year into next year. Huge upgrades, large uh, enabling of identity server, uh, IoT modules, and, and all the other dashboards will be happening. We basically want to do the e-citizens portal and mobile app as channels for our citizens. I think it would be a game changer. I'm told in Estonia, one of the people that we look up to, in Estonia right now, the only reason that you leave your home is basically for uh, a divorce and possibly a mortgage. I think now the mortgage was sorted out, you only have to leave your home just for the divorce. Everything else can be done on your phone at the comfort of your home. I think it would be a great goal that we can do that. Hopefully we can do the divorce also uh, on mobile, so you never have to leave your home. <laughs> and then, so we're looking to beat, to beat Estonia. And then lastly, we'd love dashboards and analytics. I would love to see my president sit in his car with a dashboard, with a whole, you know, the health of the government in one pen, able to click, you know, with amber, red and green, able to understand what's happening in the country for data-driven decision-making. Ladies and gentlemen, I want to thank you. Uh, and I just say, it's, it takes maybe three to tango. You basically need WSO2, you need a local partner, and of course, the government entity that puts that together. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.